Um, hi, everybody. Um, you can hear me. Uh, nice to meet you all. I can kind of see you. Um, yeah, so I am Stephanie. I am based in London, and I work as a designer, designer, artist, and author, mainly working on experimental data design projects. Um, and uh, recently, I've begun to describe the work that I make by saying that I use data within my practice to create, to connect, uh, to communicate, and educate. So firstly, I often use data to create a specific visual concept or aesthetic in an artwork or design, uh, like my piece for the Memory Palace exhibition at the V&A a little while ago now in London, where alongside a, other designers, um, I illustrated a story by the writer Harry Kunzru. Um, so I created a triptych of prints representing three world maps illustrating his story of a world pre, during, and post-apocalypse, where the um, aesthetic for the, the set of illustrations was created through gathering and visualizing data relevant to key themes of the story, alongside more traditional illustration techniques. Um, next, uh, I will use the collection and sharing of data as a way to bring people and communities together, like. Um, through participatory workshops and art projects, uh, like this commission for the Royal Papworth Hospital in Cambridge, where I visualized anonymized heart and lung data collected from patient and staff via researchers and data collection days um, in order to create a unique artwork for each of 192 inpatients' rooms that reference the natural patterns of waves, branching, and flows that are found both in the heart and lungs as well as in nature. And uh, next, I use data um, in a, the more traditional sense to communicate insight, but I like doing this through exploring ways of presenting data that are friendly, playful, and expressive to a lay audience who might be engaging with a data visualization for the first time, so that might mean making data hoppable, uh, well, danceable, like this project is the first uh, data artist in residence at Facebook in California, where I converted a month of a couple's interactions on Facebook timelines into dance steps, bringing their digital dance across timelines into a physical space. Um, or it could also mean a project that's touchable and wearable, like this art commission created with Miriam Quick, where we presented uh, weeks of large particle pollution data from Sheffield as necklaces you could touch and wear. So this is actually on display at Bletchley Park. Maybe Elon Musk saw it. <laughs> um, uh, lastly, I use data as an educator, um, where I will teach data and data collection workshops to companies, children, and people of all walks of life using nothing more than basic drawing materials. Um, so you might notice with the type of work I make uh, that when working in all of these different ways, my design approach is pretty analog. So I don't really code that much, though I do collaborate with developers, but instead I often realize concepts by hand in a more lo-fi, human-sized scale for most projects. And so that's a very quick intro about me. Um, so I've been pretty much, but I also say that I've been pretty much creating data visualizations in the wrong way since I graduated about 20 years ago. And um, I'm sort of joking, but really what I mean is that I'll often visualize data for different reasons and different, um, using different processes and what could be considered right by, I guess, for many decades leading up to this point. So for, like, for mu much of data visualization, and for some people now, the right standard way to make and use a data visualization is as follows. And so this is my um, trying to visualize this process. So uh, first, the creator will ask a question that they want to answer using data. Um, next, they'll collect or acquire data in this methodical, precise way. Um, then with this data in hand, translate it into graphic form, so visualize it, and then boom, you have your visualization. Um, so then next, um, this whole visualization is created to serve the viewer, who of course can be the same person as the creator, um, who will then uh, you know, look closely, interpret this visualization in order to gain these super explicit, insightful insights that will then help the viewer um, take a big action and go and do something and make some change. And uh, really, this, is, um, this right way is really all about serving this end goal of taking action. So that can be the whole point. But that's one approach, and it's one I've worked with often. But you can only use this process so many times before wondering what else can be done with data. So how to move forward and see what's possible. Um, 
Unfortunately, though, uh, experimentation in DataViz can sometimes feel a little scary. Uh, so for many contexts, it's important to present data in the clearest, most transparent way possible. And so to achieve this, people will often visualize data using a rule-governed design mindset focused on always adhering to best practices and processes and following them to the letter, which of course makes sense, but at the more extreme end of this best practice discourse, the mindset often manifests itself with this tone, um, you know, break rules at your peril because if you do, people will think you're a liar and people will die, um, which I know that sounds like an extreme take, but if you read the books of the, prom or I mean, I'm sure many of you have them, uh, of the prominent information designer, Edward Tufte, um, where he proposed that the Challenger space shuttle tragedy um, basically place the blame on the people who had made a single bad chart. Uh, so, you know, it, you know, charts kill people. Um, but this thesis has been debunked by researchers, but still, if this mindset isn't enough to scare someone into never wanting to try anything new with data, then I don't know what will. And so this rule-governed design mindset found in DataViz is different to the other boundary-pushing design mindset in other design fields where in order to evolve and innovate, you know, you challenge yourself to try something new and experiment, similar to how designers have been expanding the boundaries of typography and lettering with continual experimentation like shown on screen. Now, Luckily, the Edward Tufte book I referred to was published 20 years ago, but now we're in a world where the data visualization landscape is changing and it's evolving due to practitioners who aren't afraid to put, like, apply a boundary pushing mindset um, of other design fields into data visualization where instead of following that standard process or expectation or best practice, today uh, data doesn't have to just be collected and visualized for actionable insight, but is now seen as something, the, the process is seen as something flexible and stretchy as opposed to rigid and rule-based. And so um, I'll just um, show the benefit of twisting and stretching this process using some of my projects as examples. So, um, I'll get, get started with that now, of, of a few wrong ways to create a data visualization. And so I'll start with a collaboration with Georgia Lupi, a New York-based information designer. Um, we met twice in person when we decided to collaborate. Um, we realized we had a lot in common, the main one being we both work with data in this analog way. So we decided to challenge ourselves. Could we get to know each other better through data alone? Um, however, we live on completely different continents, so how could we ha create an off-screen collaboration? Uh, so in the end, our greatest challenge, this long distance aspect, was our biggest asset, and we came up with a project called Dear Data, this year of sending each other hand-drawn data postcards back and forth across the Atlantic. Uh, so this started on the 1st of September and it lasted a year. So every week we would collect our personal data around a shared topic, like what you see on screen. And then when the data was collected at the end of the week, we'd spend time analyzing it and then draw our visualization on a postcard where the visualization was on one side and the legend address and stamp was on the other. And then when finished, we would post it, wait with our fingers crossed, and if all went well, the postcard would arrive at the other person's address and we'd grab a coffee, sit down with, um, and, with a postcard and read and learn more about the other person's life. So this project lasted a year and some of my postcards are shown on screen. Um, so, okay, so how did this project flip the standard data viz process on its head? Uh, well, the, um, I guess, you know, the physical end goal of the, the data viz design process is, you know, it's a data visualization. And so you think that in our project, that would also be the case where the only reason we collected data each week was to have this end data postcard. But over time, we began to realize that the resulting postcard wasn't the part of the exercise that meant the most to us, um, but rather that it was that act of manual data collection each week became our bigger priority um, as through collecting data in this meditative way, we created this space for self-reflection and connection to our respective worlds. Um, and so through this project, we created a wrong data vis pra practice where the final drawing became a souvenir of the, um, like, of our observations about our life experiences, you know, really um, documenting that priority, the data collection process. 
Um, also, upon receiving the postcard, uh, the experience of decoding the souvenir was about gaining subtle insights instead of big explicit ones, and no big actions were taken unless you count the nice conversations we had after. So, um, you know, by twisting this process and working with data is in the wrong way, our project evolved in ways we never anticipated, um, like becoming a book on the project alongside a visual journal where people can try the process for themselves. Um, and also, um, the original collection was acquired um, for MoMA in New York, and it's finally on display now. And so that's been a really great response to the project, but I think the most exciting thing is that we found the project resonated with a wider audience. You know, lots of people have started their own data correspondence projects of their own, um, or they're using it as part of formal curriculums from primary school to university and beyond to help students learn to collect and present data, um, where the project is even a starting exercise for a high school data science class followed by over 150,000 st um, students. And so this level of educational outreach um, that just, uh, you know, is really wonderful where it all started from exploring this wrong approach. Okay, so um, I guess that's my first wrong project I'll show you. Um, but that uh, focus in the Dear Data project of focusing on data collection um, has also influenced my later public art projects where uh, for me, um, I, data sets become an interface for engaging with a community uh, where I um, offer participants space for self-reflection um, and community connection through data collection like on, um, this uh, commission updating happiness. Originally commissioned by the Welcome Collection in London, uh, the curate um, for an exhibition about happiness, uh, the curators invited me to create what they called an emotional check-in for visitors to help them think about their perceptions of happiness as they entered the exhibition. Uh, while researching the project, um, I became interested in the happiness quotes that you often find on Instagram. So they often have a very similar aesthetic, like pink backgrounds or people reaching up to the sky, beaches, sunsets. Um, but they have a problem. Um, they're often pretty superficial and they don't truly show the diverse picture of what um, actually makes us happy. So I decided with my commission that I would try to find a way of m making a better version of these quotes. So how did I achieve this? Well, I created a work where to start. Participants are invited to take a two minute survey either online or on their phone in the gallery. And the survey asked your age along with four questions adapted from the UK's Office of National Statistics for measures of personal well-being. So participants can get a sense of the measures that the UK and other countries have found are best to measure happiness like how satisfied are you with your life nowadays? To what extent do you feel the things you do in your life are worthwhile or how happy or how anxious did you feel yesterday? Um, next, the user can choose one of four questions to ask about their perception of happiness. My favorite is, what guilty pleasure secretly makes you happy but is too embarrassing to tell anyone about? Um, so then they press enter. That data is combined with the text of historical happiness quotes from different cultures to create a new quote that they can add to a growing collective archive of reflections on happiness. And somebody actually submitted this on screen. So every aspect of the design to, um, is informed by their survey ans answers and is meant to be like the opposite of those stale, bland quotes. Um, Okay, so uh, what's nice about the survey is I like how it gives participants a two minute pause, an emotional check-in to reflect on their happiness, creating um, you know, like space in their lives for this time to closely look at this part of themselves that they might not look at otherwise. Um, where like Dear Data, the end visualization isn't the main priority, but is documentation of that more important emotional check-in experience. And while the results of this um, self-reflection was mostly the good stuff of life, as shown in the most frequent words green, um, I was uh, still pleased to see that quite a few transgressive guilty pleasures did mention. Those are just a few of those. <laughs> um, okay, so these individual moments of self-reflection uh, were then displayed with thousands of contributions online and in the um, wallpaper in the gallery or um, as uh, live projection or um, 
displayed on the gallery's external facade, um, where it's, uh, you know, these visualizations of participant data gave them the opportunity to contextualize their self-reflections within their community, and um, like with others in the community, and better understand the nuance and diversity of what human happiness truly looks like. Okay, so that's a, a couple wrong practices, now onto another, um, where um, besides discovering them through experimentation, I also find them through being forced to reckon with my own ideas about how data is supposed to work. Uh, recently, I had an art residency with People Like You, a UK-based research group looking at implications of data personalization across different aspects of our society and culture. And my focus area was on personalized medicine, where data can be used to precisely tailor medical treatment through um, you know, analyzing one's personal and medical data. And these uh, personalized treatments are often built upon research using data from biobanks that collect, process, and analyze samples, well, and store samples and data for future research use. Um, so I became curious about how the biobank stakeholders perceive the literal people behind the numbers, uh, the, the data and the samples used in this research. So they, do they always see them as people, or are they only seen as samples in cold storage, or, or just numbers in a spreadsheet? So using my art practice, I began to research these questions through looking closely at an Imperial College-based uh, biobank and cohort study focused on members of the UK police force. So first, I mapped the flow of data from the donating participant, a final researcher within the biobank, and then interviewed technicians, um, principal investigators, and more to understand how they really see these people behind the numbers. And then with this research, I needed to create an artwork for my findings. And normally I would do this through finding a data set to visualize. That's because for me, I've always worked with the assumption that even when working with data in a creative way, my data needs to be precise, complete, accurate, as per standard practices, or my project concept wouldn't be as strong. However, I had a problem with this project. I really didn't have any precise data to work with. I couldn't access the actual study data. It was too sensitive. And it was really hard to access precise information about what data was collected by the study, because some was collected for a little bit for only a certain amount of the participants. So the data in the study itself was messy. So I had to do things the wrong way. Instead of starting with hard data, um, I began drawing small sketches, illustrating various processes within the biobank system to better understand all its working parts. Then from these sketches, I built a universal visual language where common processes were represented using um, very you know, specific elements. And at the same time, I became interested in Marcel Duchamp's artwork, The Large Glass, which isn't only an artwork, but also an artistic diagram of a process Duchamp was trying to visualize, where every visual element has a reason, and the artwork can be fully annotated to explain this process. Um, so, um, yeah, I became interested in creating a similar art artistic diagrams during this residency to present the data and insights I had discovered, but also accepted that my end result would need to accommodate imprecision and messiness. So using this visual language I created, I made a large, like really big drawing showing the whole biobank system where the journey the data takes is accurate, but the total number of data points moving through each part of the system is uh, mainly illustrative starting with the collection of data and samples from a participant in a clinic, then moving to the processing and preparing of these samples, um, to their storage in databases and long-term cold storage, and finally to the researchers accessing these data and samples for use in their research projects. Um, where um, alongside it, I also created a series of artistic diagrams illustrating insights derived from the interviews uh, with the biobank stakeholders. I mean, imagine someone like me, like following your job and making an artwork from it. And uh, these use the same visual language of the system map to communicate the main takeaways from these interviews. Um, where these works function like Duchamp's large glass, where when annotated is on the right, um, they provide a detailed glimpse for those interested in understanding this process representing my research visually as opposed to the standard form of an academic paper. Um, so it's been interesting seeing how researchers have responded to these um, often qualitative diagrams, where even if they're imperfect renditions of hard data, they spark conversations and ideas for how to um, um, expand further. 
And if you want to learn more, there's a website where you can see all these works annotated in detail. Um, okay, so um, next onto one uh, other, well, I've got a couple more to show, but just on this wrong project. Um, so for this, I've been pushing informative books um, in new directions um, it, with my friend Miriam Quick. I'm, um, in our latest book, I Am a Book, I Am a Portal to the Universe, it's a very long title, uh, published by Penguin. So this book was a response to the traditional infographic book, um, which was an innovative format a decade ago. It transformed the design landscape, but it hasn't changed much since. So we asked ourselves, how could we make something different than the standard info book? And so we were thinking about this, and we began to brainstorm new ideas for collaboration while dancing my baby to sleep in a cafe, and we came up with our super book idea. Um, what if we made a book where the book itself is the measuring device? So we developed the general concept. The book is a measuring de device that can be used to measure things for almost everyone from children age eight and up to adults. And our goal was to write for the data uninitiated or data intimidated, so people who wouldn't normally pick up a book with data or science in the title. And finally, our golden rule and biggest constraint, all the data would be represented on a one-to-one -one scale printed on the page at actual size. And so how do we do this? Well, this is where we tried to subvert and do the opposite of what was expected. So do the opposite of an infographic book. So to show how wonderful our universe is, we made a data book with no charts, no infographics to be decoded. Um, but instead, the book only communicates its data using its booky superpowers. So it's ink, typeface, page size, weight, volume, and more. Uh, so we might use the double O's within relevant words to represent to scale the actual size of various animals' eyes, or um, you know, use the volume of the book to talk about how if our book was water, it would keep a mouse alive for three months. Um, yeah, favorite bit of the book. Um, also, a key part of the design is that physical interaction with the book is integral to understanding data concepts. So um, yeah, interactions also became variables to encode with data. Uh, so you might have to slam the book shut as hard as you can to hear how noisy su sunshine would actually sound if space wasn't a vacuum, or um, find out exactly how many stars are born and exploded during the time it takes to turn a page. So it's not an ebook, and never will be. And the word data is nowhere in the book except for our bios where um, it couldn't be helped. So, you know, after all that hard work, did we succeed in making a book that went beyond the standard info book? Well, I mean, we think so because we won the Royal Society's Young People's Book Prize, which is a prize supporting the writing of excellent accessible STEM books for under 14s. And the best bit of all is that while the shortlist was named by a panel of adult experts, the final decision was based on the voting of 11,500 young people aged 8 to 14. And I think their decision to vote as the winner is really testament to the fact that these new approaches that Miriam and I were exploring and these like um, work and that people, young people, really, m more importantly, respond to these embodied wrong ways of presenting data. Okay, so, you know, just to wrap up with what I'm doing now, um, I think everything I'm exploring in those last wrong data viz projects led, have led to my current work, where I'm taking the standard data viz process and shopping and changing it even further in the projects I'm creating for the children and young people living on the bone marrow transplant wards at Great Ormond Street's Children's Hospital in London. So um, as part of my work there, I've been holding consultation workshops with those living on the wards where through helping them create artwork on their bedroom windows, I was able to interview them to better understand their experiences and form an art strategy for their ward. Um, and for this project, I ended up um, using the creation of a visual to collect qualitative data instead of an other way around. So it's kind of really different to my process for a lot of my other work. Um, also, I recently um, created a staff spotting safari for children and young people where they kind of uh, embark on a staff scavenger hunt looking for different types of staff working on their ward, like finding staff that can play musical instruments or love to eat spicy food, creating connections and conversations um, through this game where once participants find a certain type of staff, they color them in or tick them off a list um, and they win a prize for that um, once they've gotten a certain amount. 
So again, the focus is more on observation and data collection, and, and a data visualization is only loosely created through ticking a box or coloring, coloring in a character. And then finally, I've pushed the process even further in artwork um, I'm creating for the bone marrow transplant bedrooms in the soon-to-be-built Children's Cancer Center, where my focus is on the act of creating a nature collection as a sort of physical data set um, that will then be displayed on shelves around these new, um, the new bedrooms, bringing nature into an isolation room completely sealed off from the outside world. Where for this, I've just drawn out one single component out from the data viz process that I really love, the act of collection, and that informs the commission. So just to um, end by summing up my findings from <laughs> exploring what comes of breaking the standard data viz process and doing it the wrong way, you know, I mean, I just will end and say, you know, of course there is still a value in this initial right pro process. I've worked with it often. I still have lots of love with it, love for it. Um, I just that belie believe that there's this value in finding as many processes as possible to extend one's design toolkit. Um, you know, I think without this uh, stretching of the standard process, I wouldn't have made a project that turned into a book or um, ended up in a museum or impacted educational curriculums in such a wonderful way. And so it's been really exciting to see firsthand how working with a boundary pushing mindset as opposed to a rule based mindset in my field has such a huge capacity to impact and change the field that I'm working in. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.